And the more things we can add to this list, and I think there are more things that we can add, things like um, communication with conspecifics, things like in-group, um, in out-group recognition, at least in some mammals. I didn't want to put too many things in here because I don't know about all mammals and all of these things. These are the things that I, I've evidenced from what I've read. All mammals have these properties. But we add, as we add markers, the argument gets stronger and stronger through accumulation. This is the kind of argument we use for, not, for other human beings as well. There's no other explanation that's going to be able to fit, in all, fit all these things together without being ad hoc. And that's what makes those other explanations worse because they're piecemeal. They're not unifying. Um, and bias, is there bias in this argument? Sure, there's bias. There's anthropocentric identification of the markers based on what we experience. So is there always going to be some anthropocentrism involved? Yeah, there's always going to be some anthropocentrism involved because we are human. Um, is this a, a fatal flaw? No, it's not because we can approximate different ways of seeing things and recognize where these markers might be relevant and may, way, where they may not. So if it turns out, I don't know about uh, like if reptile sleep, if we know that the sleep patterns are the same as in mammals, if we find out there's not, they're not, or if we find out that some, some species, they that they dream, okay, cool, awesome, <laughs> great. <laughs> But if there's some creature that didn't dream, we wouldn't take that as evidence against them being conscious. We would just say this marker is not relevant for that taxa. Um, it works for mammals and reptiles because of the physiology of, of their dream, experience, of their sleep experience. Um, and then introspection. Is there a problematic introspection in this argument? There is introspection going on here, but except for the case of learning, None of, these, uh, none of the claims are based on any kind of a problematic introspection about mechanism. I gave you the example of reversal learning. That seems to me, so learning is something that um, uh, some people like Michael Tai have appealed to as evidence of consciousness, but there's some I have some concern about using that as a, as a marker because it is an introspection of of, of mechanism as opposed to an introspection of a current sensation. So all in all, I think this is a pretty darn good argument. I like this argument. It passes our pitfalls without falling into it. Um, so let's just say, I wanna say one is done. Like one is pretty good for mammals. So that was, that was the other limitation of this. The, anthro the anthropocentric worry, the bias worry, this works really well for certain kind of taxa. It might not work for all of them. So How are you saying one is done for mammals? One is done, so that's, that's all I've argued for. I don't have all the evidence that I, I just haven't put it together. I suspect that we've got really good evidence for fish, for um, maybe reptiles. I, I don't know. Gary Varn I read Gary Varner's book. He convinced me that you see consciousness very widely in, um, in the animal kingdom. Now, the question is, there are other things like slime molds and plants and whatnot. That's where I, where I have a question. Of course, you won't be here for those. I will miss those. That's too bad. So I don't know how can we, when these, these organisms are quite different from animals, how do we go about answering this question? That question one is going to exist for plants and slime molds and fungi and so on. But I think probably for most, well, I, don't, I won't say, for a lot of, for the mammals, that's all I'm saying, mammals, probably reptiles. We can move past that. Then, once we've got that on the table, once we've done that work, we can move to two. How to determine what another species feels and thinks. And I want to look at the particular case and make a parallel argument here. So again, it's an analogy plus inference to the best explanation argument for ape mind reading. This is the argument humans mind read or have a theory of mind and pass the false belief task. The best explanation for humans passing the false belief task is that they mind read. Apes pass the false belief task, therefore they probably mind read or have a theory of mind. So this might all seem completely obscure and bizarre to you if you do not know what these words mean. So I'm going to spend a minute telling you what these words mean. Um, first looking at premise one, humans mind read or have a theory of mind. 
What I, uh, and I think most people who are working in this area now, mean by this is that an individual who mind reads is able to attribute propositional attitudes to another individual. And a propositional attitude would be a, uh, a sentence that they think the other person believes, or a desire that they think another person has, or a fear that they think another person has, and so on and so forth. So in this diagram, the girl is believing that he's nice. She's just having, she has a belief. And we can represent it with the English sentence, he's nice. The boy is mind reading because he has a belief about the girl's belief and what he's representing is the girl representing that proposition, he's nice. That's mind reading. That's it. Nothing like, woo, going on here. Some people call it theory of mind. I think that this is problematic for reasons I discussed earlier, that a theory is quite a fancy thing that um, we don't need to postulate. That's an added theoretical piece of baggage you don't need here. So humans mind read? Okay, we do that, right? I mean, I, I do that. And, most adults do that, and so on. So humans can do it. We'll get back to that. Humans mind read and pass the false belief task. What's the false belief task, you might ask? Well, if you've heard this 15 million times, you can just go check your email. And if you haven't, um, this is the, uh, one of the renditions of the, theory, the false belief task. This false belief task was uh, invented by Vimmer and Perner in response to the famous BBS article of Premack and Woodruff where they asked the question, does a chimpanzee have a theory of mind? And the commentary, um, this is why commentary is so great in journals because that experiment came from those comments. Um, and I must add philosophers making comments in that article, though I think Tyler Burge had some of the most, one of the most interesting responses to that paper. Um, Here's the study. This is, uh, this is Baron Cohen's rendition of it, but uh, Joseph Parner and, um, and Bimmer invented it. You can call it the Sally Ann task. This is Sally, this is Ann. Sally puts her ball in the basket, and then Sally goes away. While Sally is away, Ann moves the ball to the box, and then Ann goes away. Sally comes back into the room. Where will Sally look for her ball? And where should she look for her ball? Why? Because you're three? <laughs> I don't know who said that. <laughs> All right, so kids who are younger than five or so will say, well, Sally's going to look for the ball in the box. And if you ask them why, they'll say, because that's where the ball is. Of course. But older kids will say, Sally's going to look for the ball in the basket. And if you ask them why, as I did and when I did this test, the study with kids in a... Minnesota, they say, because that's where she left it. So that's what they say, but the way this is interpreted is that the children are solving this task by thinking about what Sally believes. And Sally believes the ball is in the, in the basket. So, okay, premise one, humans mind read, we can attribute beliefs to each other, and we pass the false belief task by five, maybe? Um, some think it's true of human infants, too, that human infants can pass a, uh, an implicit version of this task. We'll get back to that. <clears throat> I'm skipping premise two. Let's go to premise three. Apes pass the false belief task. What? Apes pass the false belief task? I thought that in 1978 we got all this criticism that chimpanzees don't pa actually have a, a theory of mind, that they don't actually attribute beliefs to each other, and then scientists work for 40 years to try to get evidence that chimpanzees mind read. 40 years, don't give up. Talk about like null results and not affirming the null. It took, it took 40 years, right? 40 years, yeah, I think so. That's, that's a long time. Um, but then just like two years ago, Chris Kerpenye and Fumihiro Kenyo and their colleagues, um, working with Joseph Call, Michael Tomasello, and Harada, found evidence that chimpanzees will predict behavior based on a false belief. So what they did is a task that exactly models the task that was given to children, infants, a nonverbal 
infant task where they used eye tracking technology to see where the chimpanzee would predict where someone would go. Because you can't ask chimpanzees where's Sally going to look for the marble. And you can't even really motivate a chimpanzee to worry about where a marble is going to be in a box or a basket. They just don't care. You know what chimpanzees care about? You know what they care about? They don't, they don't really care that much about food. I mean, they care about food. They care about violence. Check this out. So you've got a chimpanzee watching the scene. Look, King Kong's beating up the human. Oh, the human's going to go beat up King Kong. He got a stick. He saw him go in the haystack. You see that the, the ape there, the red dots or the eye tracker, was watching the, that leftmost haystack. Is that your rightmost, whatever? And then, ah, oh, see, now the chimp's looking at the other haystack where the ape is, and the human, yeah, goes and hits the haystack. So this is all the training. This is all habituating the subjects to what's going on in the scene. They care about the scene because it is violent and exciting. They also get to drink juice while they watch the movies, so that's kind of cool. All right, so then we've got some more habituation stuff going on here. And then here's a task, false belief task. What's going to happen? The human's there. And here comes King Kong. King Kong beats up the human. Human goes and closes the door. Oh, no, this isn't the false belief task yet. Yeah, some more habituation stuff with the stick. All right. Oh, he's still got the stick. See, I should have set up the, the, the video better. All right, no stick. King Kong runs in one haystack. Human goes away to get the stick. Oh, King Kong sneaked into the other, the other haystack. Human comes back. Where's human going to go? Where is he going to beat up King Kong? And the eye tracker shows that the subject is looking more at the haystack where King Kong last was when the human was there. Not where King Kong went to subsequently or where, uh, where he went later, which was off the scene. So you see this performance in chimpanzees. They're passing uh, an, an implicit eye-tracking version of a false belief task. And what the results, I, I just have to add, it w it's called great apes pass the task, and they did it with orangutans too, and the orangutans just weren't quite as good as the chimpanzees. And it might be because the orangutans are just not quite as interested in violent movies as the chimpanzees. I don't know. Um, so the, the, uh, there was another version of this task, an active helping version of this task I won't go into, that was also done. So there were these two different tests, both of them involved, um, uh, there were two different ex uh, publications there were two tasks in one of the publications, and in another publication with the Buttleman was an active helping task. Um, these were all predictive tasks. They all shared this, um, the structure where they asked the subjects to predict where someone would go when they had a false belief. And the authors of both of these papers said, this means that the chimpanzees have a false belief. Our results in concert with existing data suggest that apes solve the task by ascribing a false belief to the actor, challenging the view that the ability to attribute reality and congruent mental states is specific to humans. It's Chris Krupenya and colleagues. And Buttleman and colleagues wrote, great apes thus may possess at least some basic understanding that an agent's actions are based on her beliefs about reality. Hence, such an understanding might not be the exclusive province of the human species. So, apes attribute, ascribe, false belief, have beliefs about beliefs, is the claim that we get from this task. So, our question then is really now to look at premise two. The best explanation for humans passing the false belief task is that they mind read. Because that's why the authors draw this conclusion about what the apes are doing. If that's the best explanation in the human case, unless there's some other explanation for apes, which we wouldn't know why there would be, we, uh, we should just assume they're doing what we're doing. 
But there are competing explanations for what humans are doing when they fa pass the false belief task. There are um, a few, so I'm, I'll talk about the submentalizing hypothesis that Cecilia Hayes puts forth, behavior reading hypothesis that Danny Povinelli and Jennifer Vonk have put forth, and the perceptual mind reading hypothesis that I think gestures to what Butterfull and Apperly have in mind um, with their alternative explanation. It's something I've defended. There's another one I didn't put on here, and this is Tyler Burge's new explanation in terms of sensory, non-mental, non-behavioristic sensory processing. I can give you that reference if you want later. I didn't have time to uh, write anything up about it. Um, and then belief mind reading, which is what Peter Crothers thinks is going on in these cases, or thinks may be going on. All right, so, um, in, in, the, in the infants for sure. So the submentalizing alternative hypothesis is that rather than viewing this movie as a narrative in which agents acted on objects for reasons, the apes may have selectively encoded relatively low-level properties of salient events. So this is Hayes' alternative explanation that what they were doing is paying attention to the color of the shirt, the movement of the objects, without seeing the objects as a King Kong actor or as a human actor, without seeing it as a fun, violent movie where someone was getting beaten up and trying to attack their, um, their aggressor. So what she suggests doing to test this hypothesis is substituting colored geometrical objects for the actors, and if the subjects show the same looking pattern, it would be evidence that the looking pattern in both cases is due to some sort of submentalizing process, some sort of pattern matching, um, since the presence of actors wouldn't be required to elicit the performance. So, um, very quickly, the authors of that study ran that test, and they found that um, apes did not, they did not, that that sort of stimulus did not elicit the looking time behavior. Um, now, what, what should this tell us? Well, not a lot, since it did take 40 years for us to get them to pass the, <laughs> that task with the, with the King Kong, um, but it certainly isn't as easy as you might think, to just put in this, these kind of geometrical figures, that's not going to do it in and of itself. So something was different with the, the violent movie and the geometric figures that were going on there. The, um, oh, and by the way, it's very weird because this, um, as I said, it's very easy for us to see intentional behavior in certain kinds of movement, and Heider and Simmel t taught us this with their little videos of the, the triangles and the circles. So it's, it's kind of weird that the apes weren't, that they didn't have any mentalism elicited by this, unless the, I didn't see the video, unless the video just looked really weird and non-intentional. Unlike this, where people will describe things as you know, oh, the, these two guys, the two guy triangles are trying to get the girl circle. Tell that sort of story. Um, so behavior reading is a related hypothesis, Povinelli and Vonk's hypothesis, is that, that what's going on here is that no matter what you're doing when you're predicting behavior as a, as a behaviorist or a mentalist, you have to first look at the behavior, right? So an agent has to notice the observable features of the subject, behavior, body posture, facial expressions, and so forth. Then the behavior reader makes an inference directly from those observable features to the future behavior. But a mind reader has to make an indirect inference from those observable features to a hidden mental state, and then using that hidden mental state to judge a future behavior. And so the logical problem is this problem of how you distinguish a behavior reader who's able to engage in, oh, you can't see that. Um, a behavior reader who's able to go directly from S's behavior at some time T1 plus knowledge about behavioral regularities to a prediction about S's behavior at time two from that hypothesis to the hypothesis that there was this intervening variable that was inferred about S's beliefs and desires. And one way to test this that Povinelli and Bonk suggested is using an experiment that Cecilia Hayes long ago had suggested using um, uh, what she called the goggles test. And this is an experience projection test. 
So what you, um, what you ideally would do is give a, a subject experience with goggles that were opaque and goggles that are transparent. There's um, an arbitrary marker on these goggles, say one's red and one's green, so they can tell them apart. And then you, um, after they have experience with these two different goggles, then they observe someone wearing these goggles, and if they predict that the individual who wears the transparent goggles can actually achieve tasks, and the individual who's wearing the opaque goggles cannot, then they must be inferring something about, um, about perception, at least. So it's maybe not belief attribution, but perception. So it'd be an intervening variable here. And what recently has been found is that, uh, that corvids and chimpanzees both pass a version of this goggles task. Again, this is something like 20 years after it was suggested. So it took a long time to figure out how to elicit this kind of behavior, but humans were finally smart enough to figure out how to test these species on this question. So I think what we can conclude is that the submentalizing and behavior reading hypotheses are not good alternative hypotheses to the um, belief mind reading hypothesis. However, the perceptual mind reading hypothesis, I think, is a viable alternative. And the perceptual mind reading is the capacity to understand what others can and can't see, what they, what they can and can't perceive. And there are two levels, this is kind of following Flavel on this, level one visual perception is just the, that the mind reader believes that some subject sees an object, and level two visual perspective taking would be that the mind reader believes that, this ob that the subject sees the object as something else. Right, so there's a mode of presentation going on in the way you attribute the perceptual state. Oh, he sees the um, reflection as water, sees the leaf moving as a predator. That would be an example of level two visual perspective taking. And what I think we can say about this um, Krupenye study is that the subjects might predict that the human would go to the left haystack because that's where the actor last saw King Kong and actors seek out things where they last saw them. Remember, that's what the kids told me back in the 90s when I did a false belief test with them and asked them why they picked the, picked the correct answer. Because that's where, she that's where she left it. That's where she last saw it. And Krupenye doesn't say that this is um, an impossible alternative explanation. In the paper, they say, we acknowledge that all change of location false belief tests are in principle open to an abstract behavior rule-based explanation. Namely, the apes could solve the task by relying on a rule that agents search for things where they last saw them. But what I want to note is one thing wrong with that quote is that that's not a behaviorist rule in the sense that Povinelli and Vonk had in mind, because what it requires is some understanding of others as agents, and an agent is a mental being. An agent is someone who acts with intentionality, who has desires, who feels pain, something, something like that. I want to beat this guy up, and this, it will hurt if I beat this guy up. That's a, that's a sense of agent. That is not a behaviorist. Um, uh, description of the situation by any means. And we do know uh, that apes know what others can and can't see. There are a host of experiments and also naturalistic observations that apes follow gaze, that apes will peer closely in order to learn tasks, that they are sensitive to what others can see and can't see. In the Buttleman paper, he said that in this active helping test, he was offering converging evidence in favor of the, the belief mind reading hypothesis. But in fact, it's not really converging evidence because it's more of the same kind of evidence. It's about predicting behavior, and that is something that we can do using other sort of mechanisms. Um, and I'm going to say something about that if I have time. Um, so perceptual mind reading maybe is a, a viable alternative hypothesis. So the last hypothesis is mind reading belief, that is attributing a belief to another to predict and explain behavior. So all of these tests are looking at predicting behavior, whether they're done on five-year-olds, 20-year-olds, um, nine-month-olds, or chimpanzees and orangutans. They're all asking individuals to predict behavior. But what is a belief? Well, 
the standard account of belief as a representation can be understood as a propositional attitude, where a proposition is the meaning of a sentence and the attitude that you take towards that sentence is taking it to be true, a belief. Uh, and that beliefs are referentially opaque. That is, there's something along the lines of level two um, pers perspective taking going on when you attribute a belief. You can't guarantee that the truth value of the propositional attitude remains stable while replacing the proposition with a logically equivalent proposition. So even if Sue's next door neighbor is an ax murderer, it doesn't follow that Sue believes the ax murderer is kind just because she believes her next door neighbor is kind. That's not a valid inference. Um, so this kind of a referential opacity is a logical property of propositional attitudes that we've never seen any evidence for in any of these sorts of tasks. And the attribution of a belief um, and that the role of a belief in the cognitive system, this is also part of the view that I think all of these authors are working with, is that they provide causes for action and also reasons for action, and that we can explain behavior in terms of the beliefs. Why did you go to the store? Well, I thought it was open. Um, it's not really open, but my belief caused me and my desire to get to the store caused me to do this. So if this idea is that humans operate with a theory of mind where we're able to understand other, uh, others' actions are not driven by reality, but beliefs about reality, even when those beliefs are false, is a claim about how we predict behavior, I think that we have, again, a host of alternative explanations for how we indeed predict behavior. And these other explanations are not going to be um, necessarily things that we can intuit. There's a lot of social psychology and a lot of um, developmental psychology involved in s establishing some of these sorts of alternative ways of predicting behavior. But what we can say is that humans tend to use belief attribution when they want an answer to this question. Right. Why did you do that? Oh, because I thought that that, that was a good idea. That's why I did that. Right? Be we're talking about our beliefs. When people ask us why, it's because we engage in some anomalous behavior that requires some repair. And how do we repair our anomalous behavior? We give a reason for it. And what kind of reason do we give? Many different kinds. We can give non-belief attribution reasons but the belief attribution ones help a lot. And there's been really nice social psychology work done on how well people respond to belief explanations in terms of other sorts of explanations for our anomalous behavior. So as far as the competing hypotheses go, I think we simply don't have enough information right now to know whether or not belief mind reading happens in any other non-human animal. Why? Because we haven't been asking the right kinds of questions. Because we were engaged in kind of some introspective errors about what humans are doing when they are predicting behavior, why they mind read, why we mind read belief. Because it's very easy after you give someone the false belief task um, to say, well, did you believe that, uh, did Sally believe that the ball was in the basket? And you're like, yeah, that's why, that's why. I can lead my students. I ask my students, how did you predict that I got to the classroom at 2.30 when class starts? Oh, I know, because you knew that I believed class started at 2.30 and I desired to get to class. And they all nod, yeah, that's right. Really easy to lead people down that garden path, but in fact, that might not at all be what elicits your predictive behavior. It might be because class starts at 2.30 and that's what professors do. They show up at class when class starts. That's all. You don't care about me. You care about professors, right? The stereotype. Um, so the argument for eight mind reading, I think, currently suffers a lot um, because there's not a lot of conceptual clarity when it comes to what mind reading is. I think we use this word to use, mean a lot of different things. There are competing explanations that haven't been fully um, explored uh, and experiments that haven't been run to defend the preferred explanation. Uh, there's bias when it comes to adults versus kids. Maybe adults solve these problems in one way and kids solve them differently and they're introspective errors. 
So there's a better argument that can get us a lot of what we want, a lot of what we're interested in, that I call the argument for ape intersubjectivity. It's again an argument from analogy with an inference to the best explanation premise. Humans are intersubjective and have markers of intersubjectivity. The best explanation for this is that we are in fact intersubjective. Apes have these markers, therefore apes are probably intersubjective. And we can define intersubjectivity as having psychological relationships between individuals. Relationships between individuals. And then we can say they permit some sort of behaviors like identifying agency, direct communication of signals to one another, treating other individuals differently from one another, so understanding their personality differences, differences in how someone's gonna act based on status, based on your relationship, your past history with them, and that there are feelings for others and sensitivity to others' feelings for oneself. So that little animation I showed you at the beginning when I said, oh, humans are so good at seeing, uh, you know, seeing these faces, that was actually, I lied, that was not from Kylie Hamlin's study where she was finding that infants um, prefer helpers over hinderers and they'll like give a cookie to the helper puppet and the hinderer puppet they won't give a cookie to and they'll sometimes hit it. It's actually the material from this study. This is Crupenye and Hare. They showed that material to bonobos. And guess what bonobos did? Bonobos reacted very strongly to these videos too but they were very different from the kids, that bonobos preferred the hinderers and not the helpers, right? So this is again why we've got to have our critical anthropomorphism going on here and say, you know what, from a bonobo's perspective, you might really want to be buddies with the, uh, and give a cookie to the, uh, to the jerk rather than the nice guy. Who do you want on your team more? Um, so, but the point is, they, this stimuli worked to elicit a response, a significant difference in response. So we can talk about some ape intersubjectivity marker examples if you want. Um, things like communication, group identity, um, there are chimp wars, that's pretty good evidence that there are in-group, out-group identities. Preferences, chimps prefer to cooperate with partners who share rewards. There's some evidence that there's grief behavior. Certainly mothers will carry dead infants around until they mummify. There are things that look like um, fairness that Sarah Bronson will be talking about tomorrow morning. And then there are all these interesting behaviors that look like they might be mm, social norms, dare I say, social norms in non-human animals. So things like infanticide avoidance, treatment of infants, preferential treatment of infants. If you're an infant, you can climb all over the alpha and steal food and you won't get beat up. You're juvenile, then uh, it's not the same story. Helping behavior, feeding rules, copulation rules, social structures, resource distribution, non-functional social markers like, say, wearing, uh, wearing a piece of grass in your ear, which is a behavior that spread through one community of chimpanzees, um, or hand class grooming, which you see in some communities and not others. These are non-functional, seem to spread. Um, and we can, so these are things that are candidate social norms because we need to operationalize an animal social norm, which I do in another piece, and then actually look for it uh, in the field. And we do know already that apes do countenance at least dominance norms, and that apes exhibit moral foundations. If you look at Jonathan Haidt's moral foundations theory, we see evidence of those in non-human great apes. Um, apes at least countenance fairness norms, and at the same time, it seems like, according to experiments, and we haven't done this for 40 years, so who knows, that apes lack punishment. They might strike out, but don't punish, um, except we do know that chimpanzees, along with preschool children, will pay to watch someone being punished. So maybe you don't, they don't wanna punish themselves, but they seem to like watching it when an antisocial individual does get punished. Um, and I could talk more about sanctions that are non-punishment if you want. So anyway, here's the argument for our ape intersubjectivity again. How does it face uh, up to our pitfalls? We, I think we can operationalize the concept so we can be clear on what the concept is. 
The best explanation here is very much like the best explanation in the consciousness case. What we have is an argument from accumulation. The more and more pieces of evidence we have for ape intersubjectivity, the stronger and stronger these sorts of arguments get. Um, and it's of anything else is just going to be ad hoc and not unifying. Is there a bias here? Again, I think it's, um, it's the same as in the case for mammalian consciousness. There is going to be some, but it's not problematic here. We're not excluding anyone based on the lack of these markers. And then are there any introspective errors? I don't think so, because these are all a current affective states that we're talking about as opposed to inferences, introspections about mechanism. So going back to this um, set of principles that this whole summer school is, is based on, I think that what I want to do, what I hope I did is give you some methods, some suggestions about how to go about answering this second question. What sort of arguments do we need and what sort of things do we need to watch out for when we do that, do it? And just again, I want to reiterate the importance of getting it right. It doesn't do anyone any favors to overgeneralize capacities of non-human animals because of ethical aims. Um, and this is why when I make this argument about chimpanzee persons, I'm like, well, you know what? There's some things, some of these things on this bubble that chimpanzees don't really do a very good job with, like language. Um, reciprocity, maybe that chimpanzees don't do a really good job, at, but it doesn't matter because this is the way in which they fulfill the, uh, the, the, the um, cluster concept. And if you want to see a little bit more about how this sort of work plays out in doing some uh, um, ethical work on a legal and public stage, um, you can take a look or watch out for the book that's coming out that I co-authored with all those other people. Uh, I don't even remember how many there are, 15 people. We, plus three more, co-authored an amicus brief in support of the Non-Human Rights Projects case for the chimpanzees, um, so Stephen Weiss will be here in two days, and he'll be talking more about that work that he's doing um, with the chimpanzees and also now with three elephants. Um, and the goal and goal with the chimpanzees is get them somewhere like this, not sitting in a biomedical laboratory and apparently being retired there, but being able to go outside, spend time with other chimpanzees in space. Um, so that really matters, but what matters is getting it right and not being too hasty in drawing conclusions about cognitive capacities that we don't currently have evidence for. All right, I'll stop talking. Sorry, I went so long. I suggest maybe a 10-minute one-on-one question session with you and then we'll have so, comments. One uh, is when you came up with intersubjectivity at the end here, I immediately thought, of course, about that, that double minuscule uh, <laughs> circle, which seems to be a very useful model for uh, blending the two inner worlds uh, together. Uh, and, uh, nice. I just thought that, that that was one of the reasons I put it that way uh, initially, that that was communication. The yeah, so because they share a frame of reference, or individuals who share a frame of reference. Yeah, the frame was a, uh, the, the concept of the, the, the cube or whatever uh, uh, it was. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm more interested in the perceptual mind reading. Okay. And I, of course, need to start thinking about uh, uh, I hope no snakes. Mm -hmm. So are they mind reading that when that human is looking away, they now can know that I can't see them, therefore this is a good time to, to escape rather than look directly at them. Are they, right. would you want to make that attribution? And if you saw that in the chip, would you? Yeah, so that wouldn't be sufficient evidence for me to conclude that they're able to, that they're um, attributing a perceptual state to you. Because it, it depends on the, the bigger story. Because if they are just taking the eye direction as a cue for whether it's safe or not, then you um, could have just a, a, a sort of associative um, process going on there. With the... Okay, okay, okay. So the first time they've ever seen any eyes, is that right? 
human eyes. Um, how would you set up a tutorial? Yeah. Tell me how you do it. How you set well, Do you know the um, Brian Hare ex experiment? Yeah. So could you? Oh, yeah. So the question was how. Um, so with the hognose snakes that Gordon was talking about earlier, that were able to look at the way his eye direction, if he was looking, as I understand it, away from them, the head was exactly the same. it was Your just eye. the eyes, yeah. Now looking away from the snake, the snake was able to engage in some sort of approach behavior. Well, it, it, it left, in other words, it recovered from being... Oh, it recovered from being frozen. Being right. But if he was looking directly at the snake, the snake did not recover and, pretend, and continued to play dead, basically. Okay, so the playing dead is an innate response. Right. Yeah, and so it, might it be that the eye gaze is also part of that? It's like whatever triggers that behavior, part of that is eye that stimuli? Yeah. Kind of of right, because there are multiple there are multiple parts of the stimuli that you would need for, yeah, yeah. But how would you set up an experiment? I don't know, could you? Uh, show that it wasn't like the... I don't know. Because you know, I know. Chip they're looking away, oh, and now I know I can get that food. That's, you know, with the, uh, right. How would you do the experiment? How would I do the experiment? As a philosopher, I would say... <laughs> <laughs> well, the, uh, the question was, how can you do the, ex how could you run an experiment to test whether or not the um, snakes are attributing a belief and that, or a perceptual state, and that with the chimpanzees, what you're doing is something along the lines of when the chimpanzee looks away, the other chimp will come and get food. But that's not quite the study that they did because there wasn't a behavioral cue in some of the, um, in some of the conditions. So the, they set up the room, this, this was a Brian Hare, um, Tomasello and Call studies, where they had a room um, with two doors on either side of that. They baited the room next to um, opaque or translucent barriers with food. The, there was a subordinate chimpanzee on one side, a dominant chimpanzee on the other. They would release the, a subordinate chimpanzee into the room with food and observed whether or not the subordinate chimpanzee would seek out the food or not. And what they found is that if the dominant would be able to see the food once the door was up, that the subordinate would avoid that food. So they were able to predict um, maybe eye directionality or bodily movements, but without any behavioral cue because the door was still down. So that's the difference. If there was a, a, some way you could do that with the snakes, if you could, some other thing that would make the snakes know that you'd be able to see them if they moved and they continued staying dead, playing dead even when you weren't looking directly at them. Like if the every, so if they were, as they played dead, all the eyes went away and were directed everywhere else except where the snake was, would they get up and move into someone's eyesight? Or would they say, oh, I better stay here, not because I'm being looked at, but because like in chess, there's no safe move, so I'm just gonna wait. That maybe might be something. Well, see, to me, the amazing thing is that we are talking about snakes and chimpanzees in terms of the same conceptual framework. Okay. To me, that's amazing. It would not <laughs> so this is, I, I'm, I'm totally with you. This is where things need to go. And uh, I'm currently doing a study on rats. I know they're still mammals. But we're replicating a vervet monkey. We're trying to replicate a vervet monkey study on rats. And this is something, culture study. And this is something that people aren't, haven't really been doing either. I think taking a look at what we're doing with the great apes and seeing how many other taxa can actually do this is super important. Okay, one other question. And let's say that the, the rule is that if you're uh, Gordon's are my age, you don't have to go to the mic. Otherwise, you have to go to the mic. <laughs> <laughs> Whoever gets the mic first. <laughs> Hi. Is a predator like a snake or a wolf 
properly predicting its prey's next movement, an example of mind reading? Is a predator predicting like, the movement of, of, its of its prey mind reading? Exactly. Um, not necessarily. I, not necessarily. I think, it, yeah, it, yeah, it's a good question to know how to distinguish when there's going to be mind reading and when there's not. So what I like to call, what I would call predicting behavior, one agent predicting another agent's behavior, is folk psychology. Or, I mean, that's what I, I say, yeah, it's folk psychology because you've got some sort of folk understanding of how the individual's going to move. And whether or not you need to attribute a state of mind to do it is going to depend on the, 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 the circumstance, I think. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, now we'll give the mic to Chris. Chris. Don't leave. No. <laughs> Hi. Thank you so much for your talk. I won't be uh, talking much about science stuff since I'm doing my PhD in animal ethics and politics, and the evening session can be a little more ethical. So, uh, and Christine Andrews have done some fantastic work on normativity in animals, uh, moral agency, and stuff like that. So, I will try to bind all this together. So I think that Christine Andrews' proposal for a new understanding of what she calls folk psychology, so an understanding that is less focused on uh, beliefs attribution and uh, belief attributions and more uh, focused on uh, social psychology, research in social psychology, is really a promising and really fertile theoretical framework, not only from a scientific perspective, but also highly relevant for those of us who works in animal ethics and politics. So, who are interested in our ethical relationship with other animals. So according to the pluralistic folk psychology uh, that she proposes, we understand others as others, so as persons with a subjective and intersubjective life of their own, through a variety of practices. Attributing beliefs and other propositional attitudes would be only one of them. So not much rest on the failure to find evidence of mind reading in other animals in that case. Am I right? Okay. <laughs> so interpreting others as intentional agents, as doing something in, in a world that is meaningful for them, uh, involves much more than that, much more than beliefs attribution. So we can say it involves attributing, attributing them goals, intentions, preferences, memory, emotions, moods, and perceptions of their own, obviously, as, as she really well explained. She's looking for it in the basket because this is where she put it, because, or this is where she last saw, saw, saw the, the thing. This is still a mentalistic uh, relationship with another, uh, another subject. So with these folk psychological skills, um, other social animals are not, are, are not only able to uh, develop complex interpersonal relationships with one another, but also even some form of norm responsiveness. Maybe we can talk more about that later in the question period. I will talk a bit more about that. But before talking about that, I want to uh, go back to the question. I want to ask, uh, does it matter from an ethical perspective whether animals uh, relate to one and to others as others? Does, just, that, does that change anything in the way in which we should behave toward these animals? Uh, Robert Lertz, in his book, Mind Reading Animals, claims, quote, that whether animals can attribute mental state is a matter of great relevance to the moral status of animals, unquote. I think he's go going really too fast. This is not a claim I can agree with. Whether animals relate to others as others can be ethically and politically relevant, as I will explain, but it doesn't impact their intrinsic moral status. Let me explain. There's a widespread agreement in animal ethics that sentience is sufficient for basic moral uh, consideration, for, ba for deserving uh, basic moral status. Uh, the question whether it's necessary is really different. I will focus on whether it's sufficient. I think we'll talk about it during the, plant, uh, the session on plants. Uh, but the, the, even if 
Uh, some people at reviews uh, think that argue very unconvincingly so far that non-sentient attitudes like lakes and rivers should be attributed direct moral standing. Uh, the same cannot be true with sentience. I mean, the idea that sentient beings deserve direct moral consideration in virtue of their ability to feel and be armed is the object of a broad consensus among philosophers, among people working in animal ethics, but I think also among society. As we can see with the recent changes in the law in Quebec and in France, recognizing animals as sentient beings with biological imperative, although it won't change, this legal change won't, change, won't be of use for most animals since agricultural animals and lab animals are completely uh, accepted from this law. But let me briefly recap the argument, the basic argument that uh, mostly all of the theories in, in animal ethics will use. First, we are not the only sentient beings on this planet. Many other animals have a subjective life of their own and can experience emotion in affective states. So this is a first premise. It's a descriptive one uh, informed by our experience and by science. And the second premise, the normative one, would go something like this. The reason why we have duties not to harm, kill, and imprison individuals is not because they are rational or because they are intelligent. It's not because they are members of our biological group. It's because they are vulnerable selves. They are sentient beings who are affected and care about what happens to them. So this is a normative premise. It's not a descriptive premise, it's an ethical principle based on the idea that we rightly reject, let's say, racism and sexism, like a discrimination based on belonging to a particular biological group, like race or sex. And we also reject uh, ableism or the idea that less intelligent people deserve less moral and political consideration. So if we accept this, these two premises, the conclusion follows that many animals, as being vulnerable selves, also deserve basic moral consideration and fundamental rights, regardless of their biological group of their species and regardless of their cognitive capacities or incapacities. It's quite a straightforward argument, really not complicated. We can talk about it if you want later. I think that there's two ways of... Um, they, 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 we can resist that conclusion in two ways. First, we can deny the first premise or the second one. Uh, denying sentience, the first premise, so denying sentience to animals, although possible, and it, it is done by some people, is a real challenge in light of all the converging evidence we have so far. And I think that we will talk about this a lot during this 10-day uh, 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 summer school, so I won't talk about it more. Most people who oppose the, the conclusion, the idea of animal rights or animal deserving basic moral consideration won't challenge the fact that animals are sentient beings. They will, they will most often contest the idea that sentience is sufficient for basic moral consideration and that if we recognize uh, vulnerable selves, then we have duties not to harm, kill, or uh, imprison uh, these uh, this vulnerable selves. But of course, as you probably have guessed, Appeal to higher cognitive capacities to exclude animals from basic moral status faces a lot of problems. I will only uh, talk about two. The first one is to justify the moral relevance. So we have to justify the moral relevance of these capacities like intelligence and mind reading when it comes to our most basic interest in not suffering, not being harmed, imprisoned, uh, tortured, and so, and so on. So why should intelligence, mind reading, and stuff like that matter when we are talking about these very basic kinds of arms? And we should be very careful with our answer, and this brings me to the second problem. It, the way in which we will answer that question can easily lead to weaken the most basic protection to many humans, particularly the most vulnerable among us. Because arguing that being a vulnerable self is, or a sentient being is not sufficient for fundamental rights or for basic moral consideration, that we need to be a person in a sophisticated sense that excludes all other animals or most other animals, will obviously lead us to deny basic rights to many humans, not only some people with severe cognitive disabilities, but in fact, all of us at different times in our lives. When in fact, we are the most in need of these basic protection, when we are really young, when we are sick, or when we get older. So as 
Political philosophers, Su, uh, Sue Nelson and Wilkie Mlika, uh, argue selfhood is the basis for fundamental negative rights and not a sophisticated notion of personhood. And this has been confirmed again and again in our theory and practice of human rights for the past 60, 70 years after the Second World War. Uh, it's, it's this crucial recognition that made possible the advances in universal uh, uh, human rights, such as the rights of people with disabilities and the rights of children. So you get the picture. If we apply our moral and political theory in a coherent and impartial way, we have to recognize that many other animals deserve direct moral consideration and impose duties not to arm, uh, not to arm them. So regardless of their biological group, regardless of their co cognitive capacities. Uh, I think it's Tom Regan who sums it up the best. What happens to these animals matter because it matters to them. You cannot put it more simply than that. So if this argument is sound, that was a brief class intro to animal ethics class. So if this argument is sound, we should be very careful when discussing cognitive uh, and social abilities in other animals not to draw ethical conclusion too quickly. You, you, uh, you uh, warned us about it in science and I want to warn it in ethics as well. So contrary to Robert Lurt's claim, our cognitive capacities and social abilities do not affect the basic moral status of animals any more than it does in humans. But we have to ask again then, why should research and mind readings and folk psychology uh, in other animals be relevant in our, in our relationship with other animals? I would like to offer three really brief reasons. The first one being that because we can argue that highly social animals with complex mind can be arms in ways that merely sentient beings cannot. I mean, they will have dimension of experience that only that sentient being without these capacities uh, cannot experience, so they will be arm in, in specific ways. So in that sense, we have to modify Regan's claim that many social animals do not only care about what happens to them, but also what happens to others, to some special others they happen to um, have developed rela strong relationship and strong bonds with them, interpersonal relationships. And by learning more about agency and social abilities in animals and stuff like that, we can learn more about what kind of environment and what can arm them. So this is quite st straightforward answer. The second one, we might also argue that these research are relevant, not because it makes like mind reading animals morally more important or something like that, uh, but because, fe uh, fe uh, because of features of our own moral psychology. These research, research would help us see animals as other animals, as, as other people, as full-fledged individuals with uh, psychological and social lives of, of their own. So that, I think, would fit well in, uh, within Christine Andrew, what Christine Andrews calls uh, the stereotype. Uh, uh, great apes re fit, fits really well with what you call the, the stereotype of a person. I like this expression. So focusing on, on these animals that like fits really well this notion of a person would, would enable us to bring down the wall, the great wall, the legal, ethical, social, symbolic wall we have erected between humans and other animals. So this, this, these research would be useful from a strategic perspective. Uh, this is hotly debated though in animal ethics because while it may have some of these benefits, it may also reinforce ableism or the idea that more intelligent people deserve more moral consideration and rights. It's a risk. So I leave that, that question open for now and I'm sure we'll discuss it again when we'll talk about the non-human rights project since this is a familiar critique against, any, against the idea that chimps, elephants and whales deserve to be free. Uh, to live their life as they see fit because they have higher cognitive uh, skills and they have autonomy. So third point and last point. Research on cognitive, and this is I think the most important part of it, uh, research on cognitive and social abilities in other animals can be relevant less from the point of view of their moral status than their political status, the political status of animals. These studies can help us challenge the age-old political exclusion of other animals. And I think this is where uh, Christine Andrews' work is the more helpful. 
by contesting that many practices associated with folk psychology and moral agency requires a theory of mind, she invites us to see other animals not only as vulnerable selves who can suffer, this is usually the way in which we present animals in animal ethics, but also as social selves who are sensitive to the lived experience of others, of other members of the communities, and also as non-responsive agents who can show self-restraint, learn and enforce social norms, and expect the same of others, expect basic uh, goodwill, a certain amount of goodwill from others. Uh, and I think this is particularly helpful in what we call the recent political turn, turn in animal ethics. I'm not sure if you've heard about that. Uh, I refer mainly here to a uh, Zoopolis uh, book by Sudan Nelson and Will Kimlika. So basically this political turn in animal ethics asks, what does justice towards animals require aside from not killing them, not holding them captive, and not arming them? So it can be seen as a shift towards our positive duties towards animals. What do we owe to animals beyond the traditional uh, negative rights like, not to, of, like bodily integrity, life, and liberty? So in the, their book Zoopolis, uh, Donaldson and Kimlika argue that this will depend, in fact, on the relationship these animals have with our political communities. Some animals live among us their whole life, uh, and we can only talk, think about like uh, animals, domesticated animals, of course, but also uh, those sharing our public spaces, like squirrels and uh, pigeons. Uh, some other animals only visit us really occasionally. We can talk about like birds who migrate, migrate, and other animals, of course, really tries to avoid us the best they can. So, given this, these different kinds of relationships with animals, justice for a domesticated animal like a dog or a cow will be different from justice toward a squirrel or a wolf. Even a wolf is, even if a wolf is as sentient as a dog, the different kinds of relationships they want to have with us will affect our, the, their positive rights, if you want, or the duties we have towards them. Uh, Sue and Will, and uh, uh, Donaldson and Kimlika in the book Zoopolis, they, uh, they argue really a uh, mind-blowing proposition, but that's becoming more and more accepted in the literature, uh, that domesticated animals should be seen as our co-citizens. Wild animals should be seen as sovereign communities, and liminal animals uh, should be seen as denizens. When I say liminal animal, I mean precisely those animals who are like wild animals, but they live among us, like pigeons and squirrels and stuff like that, and, and these kinds of animals. So they, they do not want to have personal and close relationship with us, but still they live uh, in, in our cities. Uh, so Donaldson and Kimnika agrees, they, they make a fantastic case for, for the, uh, the uh, uh, the political status of co-citizens to domesticated uh, animals, but I want just briefly to uh, explain to you that, of course, they, they accept the idea that domesticated, domestication was unjust. These animals have been selectively bred over many generations to suit our purposes, our needs and preferences in really ty tyrannical ways. There is no way to pretend that this was just. But the result of that process, of that historical process, is that they are now part of our society. Uh, they belong here, they are members of our communities, and still they are treated as a caste group to serve our interest. So, at, I cannot explain to you all, all the uh, their proposition, but what I want to uh, say is that there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of proposition in uh, in Zoopolis that might look really highly speculative. I mean, animals can they really be citizens? Can they really be uh, sovereign? And the sad truth is, yes, they are speculative, because. We don't know much about these abilities in other animals, uh, the uh, agency and social abilities, particularly in domesticated animals raised for food. We have largely been interested in how they could be useful for us, not in what they really wanted. So I think uh, if, uh, if a good deal of research on animal cognition is considered irrelevant in ethics, it's not only because sentience is sufficient to secure basic moral consideration, as I said, but it's also because of the kinds of questions that have been asked to animals. Do they really help to understand the most basic, the, this most fundamental question of any project of doing justice to animals? Which kind of relationship 
would animals want to have with us? And I think this is the, the basic, uh, a basic question that we must work toward, uh, toward finding ways of empirically track, uh, track this question and test this. And I have a couple of suggestions, but I think I won't go into now. Thank you. <laughs> We're going to take a break for just three or four minutes so that we can get um, all of you up there, uh, like as in the panel. And maybe, you can, can you turn on the, okay. And then uh, I'll stay here to make sure that anything I say ends up on the tape. And the rest of you, I'm not going to recognize you unless you go here or there, except Gordon. You, 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 sorry, that's right, you go up, so every, everybody's taken care of. So Gordon, Kristen, uh, Jonathan, Christian, Mireille, je compte sur toi avant de le débat. Ça roule encore, donc on peut y aller. Merci, merci, Melissa. All right, so the terms of reference are the same as with the panel now. <coughs> you can address any of these people, and you're invited to do so. I, with the chairman's prerogative, can, can make a quip or two, and I'll make a quip right now. For me, The question boils down to something extremely simple and monosyllabic. And in this, I'm implicitly diverging from the co-citizen co view. And, the, and, the, and you, I suppose you have a label for it. The monosyllabic term is ouch. And it covers everything. And what was one of the questions that was asked uh, this morning was uh, by somebody in the audience was what happens if uh, if you feel the pain and then a minute, microsecond later you don't feel it anymore. No, the ouch is involved there. I don't know if anybody, any of you know the scopolamine experiments in which they took women who were giving birth and they gave them scopolamine which was supposedly going to hasten the process and make it easier. And, uh, and the, the women never complained about this, but the reason they never complained about it was because they forgot. If you were on the ward when they were taking the scopolamine, they screamed even louder than the women for which for it was going more slowly, but they forgot it afterwards. In a word, ouch. And now the floor is open. <laughs> is it a question for me? It's not a question, it's a quick. <laughs> <laughs> he missed this conversation. But, but in, a, in a sense, it's an, it's an implicit criticism of both Kristen and Christian's favorite view. I don't think. I agree with Christian that it's not about fancy things like theory of mind, but I, but I disagree with uh, Christian uh, that it's Will and Chris's uh, co-citizenry either. It's just ouch. But I guess maybe you did not really get my, got my point because my point was exactly that. I mean, I was criticizing precisely Lurtz for saying that mind reading have an impact on basic moral status mm -hmm. and that uh, the, the uh, the, the basic arguments is if animals are harmed, can be harmed, we should not harm them. And this it, sentience we, is sufficient for that. We agree completely on that. And then you made a further proposal, which is just as unnecessary as, as Chris, Kristen's... Uh, okay, uh, but in that, in that case, I would challenge you about what is your uh, theory of justice among human beings, for human beings. I mean, there's a lot of injustice and harms that can be done above, like, harming me or physically uh, hurting me? The human case is complicated, but the <laughs> animal case is monstrous. Monstrous in a way that the human case never was. It's ouch. And, we, and we're so far away from taking care of ouch that mind reading and co-citizenry are not even worth talking about. So maybe um, think ahead to when everyone's vegan. And that's the world we live in. And then we still have 
domesticated animals of various sorts. We have maybe other sorts of maybe zoos or something like this. Then don't you think other things matter if we want to know how we should best be living with the other species and knowing what matters to them? So pain is one thing that matters to them. Yeah, that's really important. But that's not the only thing that matters to them. Okay, it matters when you take the bearded dragon away from its friend and it gets sad. There's two points there. Psychological harm. Yeah. There's two points there and I agree with, with, uh, with one of them, which is that, ouch, it's not just pain. Ouch is a lot of biological imperatives. Not, not being able to drink, not being able with, that's all ouch. The other part, which is, what, sh let's think ahead when the world is vegan. When the world is vegan, I can, you can bury me uh, peacefully, okay? We're nowhere near there. What we need to think of is getting us vegan. Uh, but that's enough of my quick quip. The, <laughs> the, the floor is open to all of the speakers. Yes, go ahead. Um, so I just have a question for Christian. You said at the end of your presentation that um, you would talk about uh, how we would empirically test what relationships um, animals would want to have with us, but you, I guess you didn't get the time. Maybe if you could take the time now if you had like some things you wanted to share with us. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Uh, first, I, I want to say that uh, when you explain, Christine, that um, we should not uh, draw ethical conclusion too hastily about uh, cognitive capacities. I agree with that. But there's also some kind of features in social animals uh, that we won't see unless we treat them as if they were, like, let's say, non-responsive. There are some kind of things like agency. You probably know about learned helplessness in uh, some studies, like highly ethical studies. I don't recommend doing these at all. But the way in which some uh, some can not develop a capacity or can lose a capacity for agency and so so it's it's sometimes it's only by treating them as by being responsive like treating them as communicative being by responding to their calls and to their, their uh, th that we can so i would suggest not being too careful about like giving a lot to animals and then looking if, if it works, if it does something, if, if it's useful uh, for them. Uh, one of uh, the empirically, possibly, possibly empirically tractable way, I was thinking about because a lot of people argue about moral agency in animals based on like Devas or Beekoff and Pierce work on empathy and reciprocity and fairness and stuff like that. I think it's really interesting, but a lot of philosophers who actually question the possibility that animals would be moral agents uh, is that it's because they, uh, are, they would not judge uh, the behaviors of others as moral or immoral, and they would not uh, attribute moral responsibility to them. And this is often the crux of the argument against the idea of moral agency. So there's a really old paper by Peter uh, Strassen in 1962 called Freedom and Resentment. It's a fantastic paper uh, on attribution of responsibility. And he claims that we have these basic reactive attitudes uh, to the quality of the wills of other when they, they, show, um, they, they show disregard or uh, ill will toward us. So let's say that I'm riding on the subway and then you, someone step on my, my foot and then I'm, I'm looking at them and they're like, or they are completely like, I don't care. I mean, I will feel resentment. I will have reactive attitudes toward them. But if they react like this, like, oh, I'm sorry. They don't say I'm sorry, but let's say they, they react like this. Uh, my reactive attitudes will fade. So I won't hold them responsible for their action because of the way in which they reacted after. So Strassen's basic thesis is that Reactive attitudes is the, the visceral and is the emotional side of holding someone responsible. That may be true, that may not be true. There's a, philosophically, there have been like more than 50 years of debate on this. But it could be empirically tractable in animals. I mean, do they have reactive attitudes when they are treated unfairly? One of the research done by uh, Brosnan and uh, Deval on uh, Fairness in monkeys, I mean, when they receive the cucumber instead of the grape and then they are really angry, they feel indignation at the researcher because they felt they have 
been treated wrongly and they are right, like unfairly. So I think there's a lot, you distinguish between three kinds of reactive attitudes, I won't go, uh, and the third one is more complex. But I, I really think from, ba based on this, only this kind of work, we may think that animals are not moral agents and are not responsible for the action. But if Strassen is right that having reactive attitudes is what we mean by holding someone responsible, and if animals do exhibit uh, reactive attitudes, then it may be possible that despite what we think, uh, animals disagree with us and they, they hold each other responsible, even us morally responsible. Okay, thank you. Now what I'm gonna suggest is a, a question from here and then I'm gonna call on Jonathan and Gordon to, in, to uh, make their comments. Question. Uh, so this is for Kristen. I saw you speak at Concordia last year, uh, talking about uh, norms in uh, great apes. Hey, and I remember, I remember asking if there was any studies on sort of implicit or explicit prioritization of behavior norms that might be pointing to sort of meta norms that would ground a, a moral sense. Is there any of that going on in the foundations of morality study that you cited? No, I mean, there's not even, um, I don't think anyone, I think there's, even establishing there exists any norm is something that's quite challenging right now. And I'm not even sure that I'm convinced about norms yet. I think that we need to do more science to know whether there are norms. So I've spent the last year developing what I think a norm is. That's where I've changed that kind of, the conceptual part of things. Um, but the science is still pretty much where it was a year ago. So are these norms more just being inferred from regularities of behavior? No, one of the important parts is that the norm, it's gonna be a socially learned, um, so you've got conformity, a conformity bias and drive going on, but also it's the sanctioning behavior. So I said in the talk, I can talk more about punishment if you want, so you kind of invited me to do that. <laughs> um, in human um, discussions of norms in, in humans and um, evolutionary psychology and in uh, among anthropologists, there's a lot of discussion of punishment as the sanction. And punishment is one thing that we can do to norm violators. But I think that this emphasis on punishment has neglected to take into account the role of power in, um, in sanctioning practices. So if I am someone without power and you violated a norm around me and I sanction you, I might not be able to punish you. I might not have the power to do it. I might be scared of you. Um, and so I might do things like whisper to somebody, whisper to Gordon about that thing you did, um, or I might just avoid you, or other sorts of, of behaviors um, that count as sanction because they do harm you. You're not getting a good from me that you would have gotten otherwise. Uh, but they don't look like punishment. Very hard to observe, and so I don't know how to find things like that in non-human animals. I think Hobbes has an answer for that. You think who does? Hobbes. Oh, Hobbes? <laughs> oh, Hobbes? <laughs> okay. okay. So Jonathan Birch is a philosopher from, uh, you're at, where are you now? Uh, the LSE in yes. London. And uh, he'll be speaking tomorrow night about the, um, the precautionary principle, uh, but now he's a discussant for Krista. Well, let's just talk. Right? I mean, <laughs> do you think there are social norms in chimpanzees? I think there might be, and I think Of course that, there might be. <laughs> I think there's reason to think that there are. So, the, in the list I put up on there, infanticide is one of them. Infanticide is something that happens in chimpanzee societies. It's not very common. When males mishandle infants, there's often a large outcry. There are wahoos by females. Females will even mm -hmm. intervene sometimes and get um, put, place them, themselves in danger. There was a report pub published by a Japanese primatologist just last fall on infanticide, which was the first observed reported case of mm -hmm. the infanticide itself being observed by human. And so he wrote it up and I was emailing him to ask him if there was, to describe it a little bit more fully so I could 
figure out whether there was anything like a sanction going on. And he said it was just, it was raining and it was so crazy. Everyone was screaming and running around. So it was hard to individuate behaviors. But that is one place where I think you might be able to find evidence of a norm. It's, it's, um, it's a behavior that uh, there's a special treatment of the status animal when because of their age. When it's violated, there's a reaction. Um, and I, but I don't know also what happened to that guy after he ate the, he ate, ate the infant too, um, what happened to him and how people, if people treat him differently or not, chimpanzee I mean, people. Yeah, I mean, no, no doubt in chimps we see a lot of sensitivity to rank. Yeah. Right? Um, but I tend to think that that kind of rank sensitivity is something different from normative cognition. So it's not rank in this case, it's, um, it's age, it's differential mm. treatment because of where you are in the group, but it's not a... a so a age line. is in the, the infants, yep. don't kill the infant. Don't kill the infants. Mm. Now if you're a juvenile, DeWall talks about this, if you're a juvenile and... Could you bring the mic a little closer to you sorry. And, and Jonathan, you too. If you're a juvenile and you are um, paying undue attention to an estrous female, you get smacked once, and DeWall says, and you never have to get smacked again because you've learned then I can't go around the estrus female when, at least when the, <laughs> the alpha's watching. All right, so there, there are at different stages hierarchy. of development. Well, it's a developmental issue as opposed to a hierarchical um, one, I'd say. Uh, so not just position in hierarchy, but also stage of development. Yes. It's conditioned on. Yeah. My, my thought, uh, in all of these examples of intersubjectivity, as you've called it, my, my thought is, what is it that chimps have here that ants don't have? Mm -hmm. right? or, or other social animals mm -hmm. where, where you have a hierarchy, you have condition, conditioning of behavior on the level in the hierarchy of the organism you're interacting with, you have animals piling in on each other, you have uh, markers of group membership, you have signaling, does that mean, do, do ants have intersubjectivity or are, or are there extra ingredients that you think an ant couldn't have but a chimp So the, the four ingredients that I've been talking about are um, recognition of agency. So ants, if uh, the ants that drag their um, companions kicking to screaming to the junkyard because they got oleic acid dabbed on their back aren't doing a great job recognizing agency, right? So that they'd fail that at least that species of ant. Recognizing agency, you mean like we do when we look at the moving triangles? Or like we do when we look at point light walkers, or like we do when we look at mm -hmm. non-human animals and see biological motion. Mammals are really good at seeing biological motion, identifying biological motion, whether or not it's a degraded signal as in a point light walker mm -hmm. or not. So if ants could do that, that would be one of the four conditions that I've identified. So recognizing agency, having some um, sort of a group identity. Uh, so you know, because the other one is social learning, so you have to know who to learn from. Um, you can't just copy what anybody does, you have to copy the right individual. So whether it's your species or whether it's an in-group um, subset of your species that you imitate or whether it's um, dominant individuals in your species, high-ranking individuals in your species, you have to know who to imitate. And then you also have to have some sort of consciousness of appropriateness and response to violations. And that's the other thing I don't see that we um, at least have evidence for in, in other, in, you know, widely across species. I, if you tell me we have all this in ants or crocodiles or any other taxa, I won't be terribly surprised because I don't think there's anything too fancy about normativity either um, in social living animals. Because I worry a bit about the condition that says consciousness of appropriateness because yep. that sounds like a, a normative notion already seems like anyone who, who doubts that there's normative cognition in, in chimps or, or any, anything else will, will get off the bus at that stage and say there's, there's no concept of appropriateness. Of that's that. why my paper oh. keeps getting rejected. <laughs> 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 yeah, that's exactly where people are at and that this is, um, is um, uh, problematic somehow. But what I mean by consciousness of appropriateness is some sort of behavioral response 
to what appears to be a violation of a rule. Mm. Now, that's hard. I think that's going to be hard to identify. Um, people who, so Ann Russin, for example, gives me an example of an orangutan, Day Day, who was doing a do as I do. Uh, she was doing an uh, imitation experiment, a do as I do experiment with Day Day. And this was um, a, a rehab orangutan, didn't have a orangutan mom, was pretty close to humans. And Anne had two, three coconut shells and three like seeds. And she was putting the seed in the coconut shell. One, two, three. And uh, Day Day grabbed it away from her and put the three coconut shells in one pile and the three seeds in the other. And Anne interpreted that as, no, you're getting the rule wrong. That's not how you sort things. That's wrong. You sort things this way. And another example, there are not many examples people have given, but this one is pretty good because it's also, um, it, there's experimental evidence behind it. So Diana Rice, Reese talks about in uh, uh, her work with Cersei the dolphin. So Cersei was taken from the Gulf of Mexico and the first thing you do when you capture a dolphin from the wild is you teach it to eat dead fish, um, which they don't wanna do, but they gotta learn to do it. Cersei didn't like the spiky uh, tails of the dead fish, and so Diana trimmed the tails. You cut the fish in half, and you give them a head or a tail. She had to trim the tails. Um, and she was training Cersei to do, present, um, do all sorts of husbandry behavior. So one of the other things she had to teach her is give her a timeout for when she got something wrong. And a timeout, look, and when you're working with a dolphin, looks like pretty much like this. You stand up. And you just ignore the dolphin mm -hmm. for you know one minute or something like that. So that's a timeout. And so she's feeding uh, feeding Cersei. She throws out uh, a fish. Cersei spits takes the fish, spits it out, and does this. That's a weird posture for a dolphin who's like this all the time. So Diana said in the in the book, she says, "Wow, it looks like Cersei's giving me a timeout." Yeah. And she looked at the fish and oh, she forgot to trim that tail. So then she did a formal study and just threw in untrimmed tails when she was feeding her uh, occasionally. And every time she threw the untrimmed tail, Cersei gave her a timeout and did not give her a timeout in other cases. So that, that's a signal they created together that means that's wrong. You're doing it wrong. And I think that is, that's my best example the type of thing yeah yeah i love that example of the uh, hang, on a, hang on a sec jonathan uh, gordon had uh, an intervention and then we'll get back mm. to you oh well i have a number of comments to make uh, but the ant one uh brought me back to uh, um, uh noted primatologist benjamin beck uh wrote an article once on decrying sh chimpocentrism mm -hmm. and uh, there's a little bit of that going on in our discussions back and forth, although we're qualifying that. Uh, there was a great eight project uh, book that uh, Peter Singer co-edited uh, that argued for giving a human status to the great apes, but sort of stopped there. Now we may talk about elephants or uh, uh, cetaceans and so on, but we're still drawing this line, and that is, I think, a, uh, a, a problem. One argument, of course, that, well, we have to start someplace, and so these are the uh, likely characters to, uh, to extend our realm, our expanding circle, as a, a, a singer would write. Uh, and one of the things that people talk about is with chimps uh, or gorillas or helping, saving an injured conspecific. But now there's this recent study uh, on ants helping their uh, worker ants, retrieving and taking back injured Conspecific, when they're out on a raid and they see an injured ant, they will uh, take it, carry it back. And they have these wonderful videos, you can see them dragging their injured comrade uh, back, uh, back to the nest. And they're making a decision. If the injury is too serious, that somehow the animals can't survive, or they're not, I'm inferring that, they're making a decision as to whether it's, quote, worthwhile to save that individual or just leave it there and carry, carry on. Uh, so at a behavioral level, you've got some issues that we have to deal with, I think, that are pretty, uh, pretty interesting. Um, before, you go, before you go on to a second point, let's let Jonathan finish, and then we'll go back, and okay. then we'll go to you formally. 
Oh, I was just talking about the, uh, the chimps with the grass in their ear, right? I mean, in, and whether that's an example of social norm or not. I mean, it has, uh, has that lovely feature of being clearly socially learned. It has the arbitrary feature that we think of as being characteristic of norms. Is it enforced? Uh, but that's, that's, that's what the, we the know. question. Yeah. Is what, hap and what happens also if, if the chimpanzee, if it just falls out of, of its ear, does it even notice? Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, I use but that. I'm of yeah. chimpocentrism there, of course. Well, I the use that, uh, that example actually at the beginning yeah. of a chapter I, I, I wrote a few years ago in a book that Russin has a, a chapter into, uh, two on creativity in animals. And I did play and creativity, and I use that as an example of a behavior that develops through play and then becomes culturally a tradition in, 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 in a way, as one of the examples of creativity that play uh, can, can instigate. Uh, I was just going to make a quick uh, recommendation. Even, of even before that, there's been a question oh, burning, sure. so we'll let the question come, and I'll get back to you. Go ahead. Sure. Yeah, so going back to a uh, theory of mind, so the question is for Christian Andrews. Um, I was wondering, you, you mentioned um, that, like, regarding the, the recent studies on great apes and false belief understanding, you mentioned implicit uh, false belief understanding. So my question is, uh, could you tell us more about the distinction between impl Im implicit and explicit uh, belief? Because I'm not sure I understand exactly the distinction. Sure, sorry, I didn't explain that well in the talk at all. So the, the um, distinction I was trying to draw was between the tasks, so the verbal tasks and the nonverbal tasks, or, and the nonverbal tasks are what I was referring to by the term implicit, which wasn't the best way to put it. Um, so the nonverbal tasks are, um, that, that have been done with infants are of a few different varieties. One involves anticipatory looking, and that's what we saw with the apes. I expect someone will go there. Um, another would be a violation of expectation, so looking surprised or looking longer at a stimulus when you wouldn't have expected that. Uh, and that's a way to try to elicit this kind of false belief tracking behavior um, when you have nonverbal subjects. Okay, Gordon, and then another question here, right? Gordon. Oh. Uh, well, I was just going to quickly re recommend a paper that just came out by Tom Zentel, who uh, uh, does a lot of research in animal cognition, uh, but comes from a pretty behavioral uh, standpoint. And he wrote a paper in ethology, just came out last month or so, on Lloyd Morgan's canon reappraised and its appropriateness or relevance to today. And he, uh, it's, it's historically a pretty good artic article, uh, and he goes through a number of current examples, including the uh, Wall study on equity, and equity aversion, and he uh, comes up with some alternatives uh, and brings in additional evidence that questions a number of the, uh, the, uh, the claims that have been made. Uh, trying to go back to, hey, what was the, the reason beyond, behind uh, Lloyd Morgan's canon and what would he... You, would you mind, just for the sake of the linguists and computer scientists here, tell them what Lloyd Morgan's canon Okay, uh, okay. Lloyd Morgan uh, was uh, one of the premier, earliest, uh, compared to psychologists from the early, late 1900s, uh, and he wrote the first textbook on comparative psychology, and he came up with Lloyd Morgan's canon, which was basically, if we can, it was Occam's razor applied. The, uh, if we have a variety of uh, psychological explanations for an animal's behavior, we should use the most parsimonious one, or the one that, that seems, quote, the, uh, the, the most simplest. The low, he would say the lowest on the psychological or psychic scale. <laughs> As, as he would uh, call it. So we have to be very careful in our interpretations. Uh, but he was not a behaviorist. In fact, he uh, advocated introspection as a way of uh, uh, understanding animals uh, as well. Uh, the other comment I wanted to make was, we've talked so much about animals uh, uh, like elephants and chimpanzees and great apes, uh, but some of the most cognitively adept animals are the large carnivores. And there's a book that uh, has come out recently that I think has not gotten the recognition it should by Gay Bradshaw called Carnivore Minds, mm -hmm. Yale University Press, in which she did a lot of homework and interviewed lots of people to, uh, looking at sharks, looking at bears. And I worked with bears quite a bit. And Jennifer Vonk uh, has done studies showing that in terms of concept formation and so on, they are as equivalent to chimpanzees. 
Uh, they can use touch screens and they do things really. Yet I went to a bear conference last, last year and their main interest is how can we get enough bears to hunt? You know, the, the game management thing. And I, I, I gave a talk on a bear cognition and one of my points was that you wouldn't accept this with chimpanzees, that you could go out and hunt them. Yet these animals are very cognitively uh, 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 alert, they have large brains, actually bears have much larger brains for the body size than a wolf or other carnivores, and yet there seems to be this disconnect. Bears are still, we're, uh, they just took off protection in the, uh, 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 of them in, uh, in Montana and so on in the Yellowstone area. Uh, and so these biases against uh, other large animals, even mammals, <laughs> uh, is, are, still, are still with us. But this book is, I think, a, a really interesting